Sometimes well-meaning people will, from your perspective, become you'll become under their influence rather than under the influence of your source. And then those relationships are usually strained and temporary. Step five contrast feels like variety and choices. Step one contrast feels like obstacles and discomfort. Step five is what your inner being feels like when you're in contrast. Step one is what humans usually feel like when they're not under the influence of inner being, when they're in contrast. Step five contrast is like, bring it on. That was so clarifying. I didn't even really know I wanted that. I'm so much more clear about who I am. I feel richer and broader and more expansive. I have an eagerness for life now that I didn't have before this contrast. It's renewed something in me. I'm so happy that there's something more for me to attract. That's step five contrast. Step one contrast is, are you kidding me? <laughs> Having a step one moment and knowing you're having one is a good thing, not a bad thing. And a series of step one moments makes you desire or throw rockets of desire into your vortex. A series of step one moments makes you decide you're going to get out ahead of it and you're going to have more step five moments than step one moments. A series of step one moments makes you realize that you're taking it all too seriously. You're being too hard on yourself. And usually, if you're having a lot of step one moments, usually it means you're still trying to control the perspective of others, which you cannot do. You cannot control how others are viewing you. You just can't do it. And when you finally give that up, oh, you're free. But at the heart of this is a basic belief that goes like this. Society or segments of society or teachers or parents or just humans in general, what they say to others is, you should not be selfish. And it's just such a ridiculous statement because what they're actually saying is, it's my selfishness or yours and I choose mine, not yours. <laughs> So they're not against the concept of selfishness because they can't stop perceiving and desiring for things to please them. They're just against you getting what you want. If somebody has to win, it should be me, is what almost everybody is saying. And that competition is what's keeping most people from the joy that they deserve because it doesn't have to be that way. From your inner being's point of view, everyone can win. You're not in competition for resources. When you pinch yourself off from resources, they didn't take them from you, you did. You just weren't under the influence of the resources. You were under the influence of the lack of the resources. And when you're under the influence of the lack of the resources, then you squabble with one another over the resources and you judge them for getting more than their fair share of a non-existent pie. But when you are consistently tuned in and you realize that the universe is yielding to whoever tunes into it, whatever they want, then you're joyful when others get what they want. Let's break this down because this is really a leading edge conversation. This all sort of sounded like we were talking about resources, like who's getting the cars and who's getting the pies and who's getting the money. And people do squabble over that and feel jealous over that. There's nothing that makes you feel more the lack of you getting something you want than to see somebody else getting exactly what you want. Esther remembers Tracy. She was just out of high school and she wanted a new red car. It was a beautiful, beautiful car. And she figured out how to accomplish it. She had enough earning and they said, no, 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 no. And Jerry wouldn't help her, which made her really mad at him. <laughs> but she figured it out and she got her car. And the car wheels were not touching the road for a long time. The car just hovered just above the road. She was so happy in that car. And one day she went back to her apartment in San Antonio and she called her mother crying because there was a man eating out of the dumpster in her parking lot. And she felt so bad that she had this beautiful car and he was eating out of the dumpster. And Esther said, 
well, honey, do you think if you didn't have that car that he wouldn't be eating out of the dumpster? And she said, oh, yeah, they are not related, are they? Because the abundance is streaming down and people are letting it in or not letting it in. And your opportunity to assist others in letting it in is through the clarity of your example of letting it in, not by your withholding it from yourself and walking around as an example of somebody who doesn't let it in. And so it sounds like we're talking about the competition for the stuff. And to some extent we are because there is no competition. But what we're really talking about is Am I under the influence of source or am I under the influence of something else? Am I allowing what's in my vortex to flow with ease into my experience or am I blocking it off and preventing it from coming because of beliefs that I am holding that just aren't letting it in? That is the singular question to ask yourself on a moment to moment basis. When you start playing that game of making yourself feel better because you're sensitive to people who are critical of you, what you discover is they're fickle and they're only looking at you for a moment and they're not a good thing to measure yourself against. It's fleeting and it never has anything to do with you. It's always their stuff. Understanding the laws of the universe can free you from all of that just by acknowledging, am I under the influence of my inner being or under the influence of something else? Esther is discovering something really interesting. This will help you. So Jerry, some of you are aware of Jerry or knew Jerry. Yeah, yeah. Jerry was deliberate about life long before he met Esther. And they lived a really happy, deliberate life together. And Jerry was a businessman. And in his process, he had business beliefs that were sort of guarded in nature. And Esther, for a good part of that time, even up till yesterday, actually, <laughs> Esther felt obligated, it's not quite the word, motivated might be a better word, to hold to his standards, you use the word, or criteria, in order to honor the wisdom that she knew was his. Even though, when he reemerged into non-physical, he let most of that guardedness go. So now Esther's honoring who he was, not who he is. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That'll twist your brain into a little knot. <laughs> so what we're talking about is the continuum. You see, you have in your vibration, some of your parents' vibration and their parents' vibration and their parents' vibration. There are all those things you learned in school and all those things you learned from everybody. But everything that you learned and everything that you keep active, a belief is just a thought you continue to keep active. Everything that you keep active is playing against who you really are and what you really know and what your inner being, or in this case, in this example, what Jerry is knowing. And so, you have all kinds of unnecessary hang-ups because you learned them from people who were not under the influence of source, who were having a hard time. So much of what society believes is the right or wrong way to behave is from a guarded stance that has never served anyone. And then most of you just spend your lifetime, lifetime after lifetime, squabbling over the rules that you have devised that never served anyone. And so many feeling not free and then blaming the rules or blaming each other for not feeling free. When your freedom is in your hands, it's as simple as choosing this rather than this, choosing to be under this influence rather than that influence. We had a conversation at the beginning today about goal setting or the difference between being motivated or inspired. People around you are wanting to motivate you to do it the way they would like you to do it because they've really put their foot down. And what I say goes, and at some point, you're still going to be having a good time and I'm going to be over it. So you need to just know that while you're still wanting more, I'm going to have had enough and you need to do what I say, which means you're going to bring your desire to a screeching halt and you're going to replace that desire with obedience. Got that? That's sort of how the physical world treats you because they don't understand that everyone 
can have what they want. That in this vortex is what everyone wants. They don't have any idea how things could unfold. And they don't even realize that there's really not a lot of point in trying to sort out all of the behavior. In fact, what we're really talking about, oh, 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 come right along with us, you're really gonna like this. What we're really talking about here is me and my human form trying to orchestrate situations so that there's a physical outcome that will be pleasing as compared to me and my physical form lining up with who I really am and feeling joyful in this moment regardless of what the activity is. It's the difference between controlling a condition and having a response to it or being unconditionally aligned with love and the universe responding to that. It's the difference between having a knee-jerk response to something that's happening and being under the influence of source and controlling the response. Can you hear the difference? It's like you've decided that you're going to vacuum your beautiful floor, but you're going to skip a step. You're not going to plug the vacuum cleaner in because the plug's way over there. The cord's long and awkward, so you're just going to skip that step. So you just move the vacuum all around on the floor. <laughs> get under everything. <laughs> if there are rugs, you leave tracks on them. And you don't really get the job done that you intended to do because you left out the most important thing, which was getting plugged in first. And that's what a lot of people do. They go through the motions of the action without getting plugged in first. And then they blame the way they feel or the unhappy results that they're getting. Most people are so willing to go through the motions of life lip service and motions of life. As long as I look like I'm having a good life from the outside, it doesn't really matter how I feel. That's what most people are doing. <laughs> Only thing that matters is how you feel because you're an extension of source energy and source energy is joyful. And when you are not letting yourself be an extension of source energy, then you are not who you are. We want you to just start asking yourself, as this occurred to me, under what influence was I? So how do any of you know that when you're having a step one moment that you weren't receiving inspiration from source to go put your finger on a question so that you could cause a solution to occur? Isn't that what expansion and evolution is all about? Why are you so quick to condemn yourself when you've got a question? Why do you only praise yourself when you have answers? Why do you condemn yourselves when you have a problem? Don't you need a problem before you can have a solution? And isn't the solution motion forward? Yeah. It's the setup, isn't it? Don't you have to have some experience to stimulate? You know what you've come around to? Something that we haven't talked about today, that we always talk about, and we haven't talked about today, but we always talk about it. We haven't talked about it today, and we want to talk about it today, but we haven't talked about it today. It's a really important thing that we haven't talked about today until just now, and that is the only place that satisfaction comes from is having a desire that you're moving in the direction of. That's what pathos is in art, isn't it? Is stimulating a question and then supplying the answer. Isn't that what makes for satisfaction? And aren't the most unsatisfying movies or plays or books those that just stir up all the questions and then leave you hanging <laughs> for you to make it up? Sometimes Esther watches a movie and when the music changes and she knows that it's going south, she leaves. <laughs> she doesn't stay there. She just stays for the good stuff so she can write her own happy ending because there always can be a happy ending. There always is a happy ending. There always is, and they lived happily ever now. Let your books end that way. Not, and they lived happily ever after, out there in who knows when, and they lived happily ever now. Lovely. Really good.